Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering the endocrine glands and some of their hormones. This is going to be part of my series for anatomy and physiology. And guys, even if you're way past that, sometimes you need that refresher so you can figure out the pathology of the disease process that you're learning about. So I think this is a great video for students who are still in the nursing program or have graduated, but they're about to take their boards and they're studying this is a great concept if you're learning about the um, endocrine system. So let's get started. Well, actually, before I get started, of course, guys, I have to ask you, please support me, support this channel. Like this video now so you don't forget. You're going to love the video. Like the video and subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. All right, so let's get started, guys. We're going to start with the hypothalamus. Now, um, the endocrine gland and its hormone, the hypothalamus releasing and inhibiting hormones. Anterior, anterior lobe of the pituitary regulates secretion of hormones by anterior lobe of the pituitary. Now we're going to get into the anterior and posterior um, lobes of the pituitary. Very important. Let's start with the posterior. So in the posterior, guys, you have um, two, oxytocin and ADH, antidiuretic hormone. So this makes it easy for you to remember because everything else is in the anterior. In the pituitary, in the posterior pituitary, you only have two. You have oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone. Those are the only two hormones you have in posterior. Everything else is in anterior. So let's start with oxytocin. With oxytocin, it um, acts on two um glands, let's say tissues, I should say, the uterus and the mammary glands. Let's start with the uterus. What does oxytocin do to the uterus? Let me make this a little bit bigger. There's a glare. All right, there we go. Stimulates contraction. Oxytocin stimulates contraction. So um, oxytocin, when you hear pitocin, that's the same drug they're talking about. So what do you think about stimulating contraction? What would that be helpful for? A woman that's in labor and, you know, the turkey's ready to come out the oven, right? She needs that uterus to be contracted so the fetus can be expelled from the uterus. So oxytocin on the uterus, it causes um, contraction. On the mammary glands, it stimulates ejection of milk into the ducts. Now, I want you to know this on the side. I wrote not production. It doesn't make production of the milk. Look at what it does. It stimulates ejection of the milk that's already been produced. All right, so we talked about oxyto oxytocin, how it works on the uterus and the mammary glands. Now let's talk about ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Anti, to work against. Diuretic, as in diuresis, excessive urination. So antidiuretic hormone, this is something that would make you hold on to your fluids instead of losing it through urination. It acts on the kidneys, right? And look at the actions. It stimulates re absorption of water conserves water energy now you see this one letter in this word reabsorption made all the difference that a because when you had when you have reabsorption you're holding it back in you're taking it back up but when you have resorption without an a you're breaking down you're releasing you're letting it go that a in the word or not having the A will make a difference in you getting that test question right or wrong. So read very carefully and read slowly. So ADH, antidiuretic hormone, it stimulates reabsorption of water, makes you hold on to your fluids, right? Helps you conserve um, water. So just the fact that we know that ADH helps you hold on to water. If a patient has too much ADH, they may be holding on to too much fluids, right? Which means their blood pressure is going to be increased. We may see the heart rate increase because the heart uh, trying to push out all um, this fluid. We may see the patient may even go into CHF. We can see a lot of different conditions when the patient has too much ADH. Let's think about the opposite. They don't have enough antidiuretic hormone. And we may know the antidiuretic hormone makes you hold on to your fluids. So if you don't have enough of that, right, you can, be let, you can let go of too much fluids and that can cause dehydration. I'm teaching you in this way, guys, so when you're seeing um, these different hormones and you see a lack of or it's too much, you have to think about, okay, what's happening to my patient? What are the signs and symptoms I would expect to see? And that's going to lead you to your nursing interventions. 
All right, so we talked about the two hormones in the posterior lobe of the pituitary, oxytocin and ADH. Now let's move on to the anterior lobe where everything else is. Let's start with a growth hormone. And as you can imagine, growth hormone helps you grow. It stimulates growth. It stimulates production of insulin-like growth factors and it stimulates growth by promoting protein synthesis. Prolactin. Prolactin, it acts on the mammary glands, the breast again. Again, think of it, prolactin, that LAC, what do you think of? Milk. Stimulates milk production. You see the difference? Prolactin stimulates milk production while um, our ox oxytocin acts on the mammary glands to what? Eject milk. Make sure you know the difference. Do not confuse the two. Let's keep going. TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. You know that butterfly shaped gland right here on your neck, right? Your thyroid gland, thyroid stimulating hormone. So it acts on the thyroid gland. Look what it does. It stimulates secretion of thyroid hormones. And specifically guys, when you see secretion of thyroid hormones, they're talking about your T3 and T4. We'll get into that in a minute. I'm trying to get rid of this glare. No, not so much. Okay. So it stimulates secretion of thyroid hormone and it stimulates um, increase in size of thyroid gland. Let me not go over that. Let me not move past this. So let's talk about this. Thyroid hormone. Whenever you guys think of the thyroid hormones, your T3, your T4, you think of the thyroid gland. I want you to think of metabolism because what the, those thyroid hormones do, it increases your metabolism. It helps you burn calories. It speeds things up, right? So it brings up the blood pressure. It brings up the heart rate. It brings things up. So if a person um, has an increased um, uh, thyroid function, if they have increased thyroid function, right? They would be what? Burning a lot more uh, calories. Their metabolism is increased. And the opposite, if they have a deficient amount of thyroid hormones, they don't have enough T3 and T4. That means their metabolism's what? Down. They're going to be, they're not going to be burning as many calories as they should. So that's important to know. Okay. So when you're thinking of the thyroid hormones, I want you to think of metabolism. I want you to think of burning calories. Next, adrenocorticotropic hormone. This acts on your adrenal cortex. Now, if you take your two hands like this and you put it behind your back, right where your, what are these called? Your palms, right where your palms are, where you put it behind your back. Those are kind of where your kidneys sit, right? Right above your kidneys, guys, is um, your adrenal glands. You have the adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla. We're talking about the adrenal cortex right now. So the ACTH, it acts on um, the, the target tissue, I should say, is the adrenal cortex. Look at what it says. Stimulates secretion of adrenal cortical hormones. What I didn't like about it, this book, is that it really didn't tell you what those hormones are. And you absolutely have to know it. It talks about it later in this book, but I put it here for you, your salt, sex, and sugar. And let me explain to you what that salt, sex, and sugar is. The salt is your mineral corticosteroids. Your sex is your androgen hormones and your sugar is your glucocorticoids. I'm going to say that again. When it comes to your the adrenal cortex, it stimulates secretion of the adrenal cortical hormones, which your salt, that's your mineral corticosteroids, your sex, which are your androgen hormones, and your sugar, which is your glucocorticoids, also your cortisol, okay? So I want you to think about this before I move on. Let's think about a patient where their adrenal cortex isn't working the way that it's supposed to be working. They don't have enough salt, sex, or sugar. What kind of disease process would you think would be going on with them? Addison's disease, where they need to add the salt, sex, and sugar. They don't have enough salt, mineral corticosteroids. They don't have enough sex, those androgen hormones. They don't have enough sugar, the glucocorticosteroids. Moving on. Gonadotropic hormones, they act on the gonads. And look at what it says here. It stimulates gonad function and growth. Well, when they're talking about gonads, what are we talking about? Those sex organs, such as your ovary and the testes. Ovary for females, testes for males. 
thyroid gland. Remember again, guys, that thyroid gland that sits right here on your neck, right? T3 and T4, those are your thyroid hormones. They stimulate metabolic rate. So if you have increased T3 and T4, you're going to have an increased metabolism. And if it decreased T3 and T4, decrease, right? So the patient with too much T3 and T4, do we expect to see them very, very thin or very, very heavy? Very, very thin. Where they don't have enough of that T3 and T4, we tend to see them on the heavier side. Calcitonin. Calcitonin acts on the bone. What does calcitonin do? Look, it decreases blood calcium concentration by inhibiting. That word inhibiting means to stop, right? By inhibiting or slowing down calcium release from the bones. So when it comes to calcitonin, this is what you need to be thinking about. It decreases the blood calcium cal uh, concentration. All right. So if calcitonin decreases the calcium in the, in the blood, where would it go? To the bones. So calcitonin, while decreasing the calcium in the blood, it increases the calcium where? In the bone. It makes the bone stronger. And that's what I wrote here on the side. So when you think of calcitonin, think of calcium, but making the bone stronger. Calcitonin, it decreases that calcium in the blood and puts it in the bone. Okay. Now let's talk about the parathyroid glands. So there's like four nodules that sits right under your um, thyroid gland. Those are what are known as your parathyroid glands. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Now, just like I said, when you think of the thyroid gland, I want you to think of metabolism. When you think of the parathyroid gland, I want you to think of calcium. But I want to be more specific. When I say calcium, I want you to think about calcium in the bone. They help increase calcium in the bone. Think about it. If it increases calcium in the bone. I'm sorry, guys. Let me back up. I had a brain fart. When you think of the parathyroid glands, I want you to think of increased calcium in the blood, not the bone, in the blood, right? Parathyroid glands. So if it increases the calcium in the blood, where would that calcium be decreased? In the bones. So it's the opposite from calcitonin. Remember how calcitonin made the bone stronger because it took calcium from the blood and put it in the bones? Well, the parathyroid gland does the opposite. With parathyroid hormone, it increases calcium in the blood and makes the bone weaker. And that's what I wrote right here, makes bone weaker. So they work in the opposite, okay? Calcitonin. Calcitonin makes the bone stronger and takes calcium out of the blood. And parathyroid hormone makes the bone weaker by taking calcium out of the bone and putting it in the blood. Let's talk about islets of Langerhans of the pancreas. So guys, in the pancreas, you have the beta cells, which are in the islets of Langerhans, and they do what? Produce insulin. That's very important for you guys to know. It decreases glucose concentration. Let me tell you what insulin does. Insulin is the key to get um, sugar, to get glucose out of the blood and to the tissues where they belong. Because let me tell you something, it's your tissues that need the sugar, okay? In order to feed and to be able to function. When that sugar stuck in the bloodstream, it's doing absolutely nothing. Your tissues are screaming, help, help. I need to eat. I need to feed. I need to function. And I can't function without glucose because the glucose stuck in the blood. Well, insulin is the key that unlocks all of that glucose that was stuck in the blood to go to the tissues, um, to those target tissues where they belong so they can be effective. And that's how they decrease glucose concentration in the blood stimulates a glycogen production. Remember glycogen, that's the stored form of glucose. Doesn't uh, glucose go into a stored form? Doesn't that lower the glucose level? Of course it does. So insulin is very important. Glucagon, it stimulates glycogen breakdown. So it does the opposite. I just told you that that glycogen is a sto stored form of glucose, right? So if it stimulates the breakdown of glycogen, it's going to increase the glucose level. Because that glucose was in storage. And now that storage is broken down. So guess what? It's turning back into glucose again. 
So those kind of work is opposites. Now, adrenal medulla. Remember when I talked to you about the adrenal glands, I told you go like this, touch your back, where your palms are, that's where your kidneys are, right above your kidneys, you have your adrenal glands, you have your adrenal cortex, and you have your adrenal medulla. We already talked about the adrenal cortex. The adrenal cortex is responsible for your salt, sex, and sugar, your salt, your adrenal, um, your mineral cortical steroids, your sex, your adrenal glands, your sugar, your glucocortical steroids. We talked about that. That's your adrenal cortex, right? Now we're talking about adrenal medulla. That's the inside, the middle part of the adrenal gland, right? What's that responsible for? Epinephrine and norepinephrine. Norepinephrine and epinephrine, these are your fight or flight hormones. These are the hormones that give you energy when your body's in stress, whether it's a psychological stress or a physical stress. This is what gives you the energy to either fight that stress or flight, run away right? Um, I've told my students the story before. I'm not sure if I told you this online, but very quickly, just so you guys can, you won't forget after I tell you this, but um, years ago, this must have been maybe a decade ago, um, I was in a vacationing in Puerto Rico and I came out of a store and someone stole my wallet and I saw who it was. I just had my son, maybe this was 11 years ago, maybe, maybe like Matthew must have been like six, seven months old. And all I remember doing, once I realized who it was that stole my bag, I threw my son to my husband and I was after her. And I'm talking, but this is Puerto Rico. So it's a very hilly country, right? So she's running up the hill. I'm running up the hill. She's running down the hill. I'm running down the hill. She's turning the corner. I'm turning the corner. Let me tell you something. God's grace and mercy allowed me not to catch her because if I caught her, I would have beat her to the white meat and Professor D would have been in jail somewhere, right? You wouldn't have me here teaching you right now. But what gave me that energy to be able to run after her for so long? This, that epinephrine, norepinephrine kicked in. Blood pressure went up. Heart rate rate went up. Respirations, I had energy to run after that lady, right? Epinephrine nor epinephrine helps the body cope with stress, whether it's psychological or physical. It increases heart rate, blood pressure, metabolic rate. I want you to think about this, guys. The more active that you are, the more activity that you do, the more oxygen, vitamins, minerals, nutrients that your body needs in order to keep up with whatever that activity is, right? So the way I was running after that lady, and mind you, I'm doing all of this running, guys. I love to vacation. So when I vacation, I never keep more than $100 in one place. So I'll have $100 in the wallet, then $100 under my left shoe, and then $100 in my left pocket. Just in case something happens, you know, I still have money. So it really wasn't even about the money. I was, it was just a fact that how dare you, but I digress. But anyway, your body needs that energy. So this is what happens. You expect to see the heart rate go up, the blood pressure go up, the metabolic rate go up, um, blood being rerouted to vital organs, fat mobilized, increased blood glucose concentration. Why? Because glucose is a form of energy. Your blood glucose is supposed to go up to give you that energy to fight or flight, run away from that stress. Okay. What's responsible for it? Again, adrenal medulla. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, adrenal cortex, which I talked to you guys about already, responsible for mineral cortical steroids. Do I have a pen in here? No, I don't. Oh, yes, I do. That's your salt, aldosterone, glucocorticoids. That's your sugar. Did they put the androgens on here? No, they didn't, but I'll add this. And androgens. And those are your sex hormones. Okay, adrenal cortex. Guess what? This kicked in for me too. The mineral cortical steroids. Look at this. Maintains, because mineral cortical steroids, remember that's your salt. It maintains salt and potassium balance. Remember salt and potassium, they have an inverse relationship. This is important to know. Excuse me, guys, I'm sick. Please forgive me. It increases sodium reabsorption. Remember that A? So that A, reabsorption helps you hold on to the salt, 
That's why mineral cortical steroid salt and increases potassium excretion. And that makes sense because sodium and potassium has an inverse relationship. So when the sodium's up, the potassium's going to be down. When the potassium's up, the sodium's going to be down. Again, the glucocorticoids, when I was running after that lady, my body, the, my adrenal cortex was um, pushing out a lot of sugar for me because I needed that glucose for energy. Look, helps body cope with long-term stress, increases blood glucose concentration, mobilize fat. And again, and also guys, your androgen hormone. Let's keep going. The pineal gland. What's that responsible for melatonin? Principal actions, it regulates biological rhythms. And you know, guys, sometimes I think the textbooks, they they just use all these wordy phrases. When they say biological rhythm, what they mean is the rest sleep cycle, okay? So when you think of melatonin, I want you to think of sleep. May help regulate onset of puberty. Ovary, responsible for estrogen. That's the female um, hormone, right? It maintains sex characteristics, stimulates growth of the uterine lining. And here I wrote keeps calcium and bone. That's important for you guys to know. Estrogen is to the to female what um so what I'm looking for. Testosterone. Estrogen is to the female what testosterone is to the ma male. And what I mean by that, estrogen is the female hormone, testosterone is the male hormone. Well, let's go back to estrogen. Estrogen, one of the functions of estrogen, besides maintaining the sex characteristics, stimulating um, growth of the uterine lining, it keeps calcium in the bones where they belong to make the bones strong. What happens, guys, as a woman goes through menopause and the estrogen goes down, that estrogen goes down, the calcium that was hanging out in the bone says, oh, party time, no estrogen. Let's go hang out in the blood. We don't need to be in the bones anymore. So the calcium leaves the bone and goes to the blood and the bone gets weak. And that's why women who are postmenopausal are at risk for fractures. Why? Because if they're postmenopausal, that means that estrogen has gone down. And estrogen, one of the functions was to keep the calcium in the bone where it was supposed to be to keep the bone strong, okay? Now, here's the thing. As men get older, their testosterone levels get lower. And so um, calcium tends to leave the bone and go into the blood for men, but not as high a rate as it does for women. All right. So anyway, for, um, for the ovaries, the ovaries are responsible for estrogen and progesterone. Progesterone acts on the uterine and it helps with um, development of the uterine lining. Now let's talk about the testes. I remember we were talking about the ovaries. That was for women, estrogen, progesterone. Now we're talking about testes for men, testosterone, thymosin, and AN ANF. Testosterone, that's the male hormone. And like I said, guys, it keeps calcium in the bone. It's responsible for maintaining sex characteristics for the male. Promotes spermatogenesis. Thymosin. It acts on the thymus gland. Something I wrote here, you guys should know, is this thymus, uh, the thymus gland, it tends to uh, shrink as the um, ch child gets older. So it's larger in childhood and it tends to shrink as they get older. But when you think of uh, the thymus gland, I want you to think of immunity, immune response. That's what it helps with, okay? Immunity. And last, ANF. ANF it promotes sodium excretion. Remember, guys, fluid follows sodium. So where sodium goes, fluid goes. So if the ANF works on the kidneys to promote sodium excretion, guess what else is going to leave with the sodium? Fluid. And that's why that blood pressure gets lowered. And guys, that is it. I'm actually, I can't say that is it because I'm going to go more in depth on these glands and the hormones, but this is the basics that I just went over and I'm going to build on top of that. Uh, please let me know in the comment section what you guys thought about this video, if it was helpful to you, what you'd like to see more of. Don't forget to like this video if you haven't done so already. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. I'm not going to ask you to share this video because I'm sick, I'm coughing. Don't share it. That's just for us. Um, I ask you to share another video that's actually a good one. But please, guys, 
I'm asking you to please continue to support my channel and help me grow so that I can have uh, more resources, availability, and time to make videos for you guys. I'm so excited, guys. I'm almost at 100,000. I'm almost there. So I'm asking you, please help me help me to push that number over to 100,000. Uh, thank you so much for watching this video, guys. You guys will catch me on the next video.